thank you. It is an honor to be here, uh, you know, especially since I remember when I was first a PhD student, you know, one of my heroes was actually Roy Radner, a faculty member here at NYU. So I was using economic modeling trying to figure out how to make these things work. So it's nice to be in this location. So I want to start with a question that's the title of the talk. How many do you think that platforms are different than traditional firms? What I mean, is this a question that they are fundamentally different, or is it just a matter of degree of difference versus degree of kind? Or is it fundamentally different, or is it just different degrees of things? It's just a little faster, uh, a little swifter, that kind of thing. How many of you think they're fundamentally different business models? Well, a little less than half the audience, so this is interesting. How many, so how many of you think they're not fundamentally different business models? Not less than another little half, so some are asleep, okay. Um, Right, those numbers don't add up to 100%. Another question, <laughs> okay, uh, another question. How many of you think Facebook should be separated from Instagram, should be separated from WhatsApp? This is, the pres this is a presidential issue right now, right? The candidates are even discussing this, right? To actually remedy some of the market power of the dominant platforms. A minority of folks on, on that one. How many of you think GDPR is a good idea? Oh, I, now we're approaching larger numbers. There's some hesitation in here. I don't even know what GDPR is. Okay, that's, that's the general data privacy regulation where they restore rights and privacy. I'd like to actually speak to all of those things today and give you a couple of impressions on it. Because I actually think some of the business models are different between the time of Ford uh, you know, and the time of uh, Cal you know, Travis Kalanick uh, in Uber. I actually think that there are some differences. So the way I want to actually approach this is to start with some of the data and from there, work through a model of how to think about these problems, because the model then actually helps give you answers to these different problems. So one of these things is, since the turn of the previous century, since the 1900s, the dominant firms in the economy in terms of market capitalization have been what? Energy and banking. Energy runs the economy. Banking, finance also helps run the economy. If you take the seven largest firms in the um, energy sector, they amount to one5 Five trillion dollars worth of market capitalization. If you then look that in the banking sector, that is 1.7 trillion dollars worth of market capitalization. However, if you look at the top seven platform firms, it's three times that, right? It's now 4.8 trillion dollars worth of market capitalization for the seven largest platform companies. Well, what about the asset basis of the firm, how the firm operates? If you go back two generations ago, the 1970s, um, you know, 83% of the market value of firms in the S&P 500 was based on tangible or physical assets, and only 17 based on intangible assets, like information. However, today, it's exactly the opposite or inverse of that. Only 16% of the asset base is physical assets, as distinct from 84%, which is now intangible assets. Well, let's take another chart. This is one you may have seen me use on a few other occasions, but these, the, these numbers are literally from yesterday, so we rolled this forward to today's time. Notice anything different about the columns in this chart, okay? This is the start year, the employee base, and the market capitalization. What's interesting is that Uber is substantially more valuable than BMW, even though it has about a tenth of the employees, and it was founded only 10 years ago as opposed to 100 years ago. Extraordinary difference. Or if you look at Airbnb, founded 11 years ago, again, less than a tenth the employees of Marriott or in there. Or New York Times, a traditional business uh, versus Twitter. Or my particular favorite here is Walt Disney versus Facebook. Facebook, 30,000 employees, is double the value of Walt Disney. You and I create the content for Facebook, whereas they hire the world's best copywriters and designers and videographers for Walt Disney. Now, if you look at the ratio of market value to employment, what's really interesting is that the platform firms are, excuse me, the platform firms are, you know, 7 to 15 or 17 times more effective in their asset base. That's the market value per employee is an extraordinary ratio. So they're moving really fast, they're creating extraordinary value, and it's doing it with fewer employees and fewer assets. What the hell's going on? Um, so, another point, 
Here, in this case, I've got to give a plug for Annabelle's new book, and here there's some interesting data. So what I've given you so far is anecdote, and I want to give you a little bit of statistics on this. This is from, this is from Annabelle's uh, new book with Michael Cusimano. What they did is they actually selected on an uh, industry control sample of firms, uh, compared that with the Forbes Global 2000, and then they selected out 43 companies that had platform assets. What's interesting, on a sales basis, the first pair of columns, there wasn't as much difference as you might think. You know, four, um, four uh, that's in what, millions of dollars. So it's four, eight, uh, hundred thousand versus four, three hundred. Um, but on the employees, 19,000 versus nine, eight hundred, statistically significant. Market value, statistically significant. R&D in sale, for sales, statistically significant. Growth and growth in sales and growth in market value, all statistically significant in the differences between those two things. I'm going to assert they are different. I'm going to assert they are fundamentally different, and let's see if I can give you the logic as to why. But also, let me give you further evidence of why it's a problem or how it's challenging. How about antitrust today? How do we think about antitrust for gigantic firms? Well, the first thing we ask is market dominance. How much of the market do they control? Do they control you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the marketplace? The other thing we look at then is do they restrict output using classic economics there's a competitive price, the oligopoly price, duopoly, and monopoly prices that you might pay. By restricting output, they can actually charge more for the good. Or do they engage in predatory pricing, where they actually price below marginal cost, which doesn't make economic sense in a traditional industry? What's fascinating is that by all of these tests of traditional antitrust, platforms fail. What the heck is the relevant market? Is Amazon in books, cloud, publishing, e-commerce, home devices, groceries? Is Alibaba in e-commerce, health insurance, cloud, payment, logistics, movies? Is Google in search, maps, home devices, self-driving cars? What is the relevant market in this context? Or if we look at restricted output, Google's not restricting your searches, your maps, or your email. Alibaba and Amazon don't restrict sales they want as many sellers as possible in the marketplace. Facebook doesn't restrict your posts or your readings. They're not restricting the output at all. Or if you look at marginal costs, what's fascinating, we know from two-sided pricing, zero is often profitable. So they're certainly pricing at a very, very low rate. We're failing all of the traditional tests of predation along with the normal remedies that we might have for a traditional monopoly firm. So I want to go after a couple of different things within this. So let's consider, why do platforms have such high valuation but so few employees? How do they scale so fast? Why is it these platform firms, when they go up against products, constantly do better? They almost always win in head-to-head -head competition. Executives that are transitioning from traditional business have a really hard time thinking about the nuances of the complexity of this. Why is that the case? And if we're going to actually regulate them, how the heck are we going to do it? Is it the case that we want to use breakup as a remedy? Is it the case that GDPR for privacy is likely to work? That's the European legislation that restores privacy rights back to the individuals. Many of you may not have heard of PSD2, which is also European legislation for open banking. What that does is it opened APIs such that each of you could grant access to a third party company to manage your banking funds so to create competition on the banking. Are these interventions logical, will they create value? The assertion I'm going to make, every single one of these questions can be answered with the same model. Once you understand the dynamics of how value is created, we can answer each of these questions in a reasonable and logical way. It also means you can use it for design. I am going to argue that there is a sea change taking place in the construction of business models. What we're seeing today with the rise of internet giants is fundamentally a gigantic um, issue of industrial monopolization, but it's for the opposite reason that we observed a century ago. Right? There is a structural change. We need to understand the nature of that change and why it's happening. The original industrial giants occurred in energy, automotive, iron, oil, railroads. Each of these were driven by supply side economies of scale Massive fixed costs, low marginal costs. Your first watt of electricity is extremely expensive to produce. Your second watt of electricity, extremely inexpensive to produce. Likewise, with a railroad, if you're transshipping between New York and Chicago, 
Getting the rights of railroad between that is expensive. Laying the track is expensive. Creating the locomotives. So your first transshipment is extremely expensive. Your next one, extremely inexpensive. Very hard, and so you get these economies of scale. What's interesting is that we observe something similar in the internet economy, but it's a very different set of phenomena. So Microsoft still has 90% market share in desktop. Alibaba, 80% e-commerce e share in China. Android, 87% market share in mobile. Facebook, now up to 2.8 billion users despite Cambridge Analytica. Amazon, two-thirds of book sales. YouTube, 77% of all online video watching. WeChat, I don't know if you've used that. That Facebook wishes it was WeChat. They are unbelievably the most dominant platform in China. The user engagement there is the most successful platform of platforms anywhere. Uh, it's extraordinary um, how deeply embedded that is in society. Each of these are driven by network effects. I think um, uh, Melissa and others actually described network effects earlier, but think of them as users creating value for users. That attracts users, which then creates value for other users. Mathematically, or just uh, graphically, we can represent those in very simple fashion. Okay, on the supply side economy of scale, justifying a natural monopoly in semiconductors, utilities, railroads, whatever, you, you get scale, which lets you drop prices, which kills the competition, which gives you scale, which lets you drop prices, which kills the competition, giving you volume in each of these instances. What's happening in the network effect, with users creating value for other users, you're moving the demand curve up and to the right, as opposed to the supply curve down and to the left. Again, I'm arguing it's the opposite side of the profit equation, but it's still creating gigantic monopolies. So what's happening is users attract users, which creates scale, which creates more value, which creates scale, which creates more value. You're getting a positive feedback effect. Now, the next set of slides, I'm going to ask you to bear with me for three slides. There's going to be a little bit of math, and I'm going to try to justify this in, with some intuition if you can get the intuition for this, you can answer all five questions I gave you earlier. Okay, so bear with me on this one. So here is what we modeled was a production function of value for a platform. All right, just think of value up here as the V right up here. And then you're going to give some of it away. You're going to open the APIs. You're going to give away the system developer toolkits. You're going to actually give away templates or software. So you're going to give some of that value away, or you could choose to sell it. The developer is going to use that access, the APIs, the SDKs, to create apps in their marketplace. So how the platform gets profit is the prices that are charged times the output in the first period times the royalty rate. Then in the second period, it's the exact same thing. It's the royalty rate times the prices times the output, just discounted into the next period. The obvious pr production function for developers is just the similar thing. It's how much they produce how much they produce times what they keep from the royalty rate, and then the discounted version of what they produce with what they keep in the royalty rate. The next piece of it is what we did for an industrial organization was borrow a classic model of production function. So you use the input, the free information, the software that's given away. So you've given away this about here, then your production function produces that. The innovation in the model is that your second period production is a function of your first period production. What we mean by that is all the software that's produced in the first period then becomes available in the second period so you can build from a larger base if there's more software. So if I give you lots of access to subroutines, I give you things on GitHub, I give you tools, and the more tools you've got, the more you can construct. It's a digital edifice that you're building, all right? But what, what, now watch what happens. Because you can build on larger amounts, if you make this recursive, here's what happens. N is the number of developers in there, and there's the output. As you get more here, you get a natural network effect. You get a spillover, which gives you more value in your next period, okay? What you're managing is that network effect. Now, I'll step back for a moment. One of the deepest questions any firm can ask, I don't care if it's a startup, conglomerate, whatever, is how do you create the most value? How are you going to organize for production? There's been an age-old question since the time of Coase, Williamson, and others, and transactions costs, how do you organize for production? Are you better off with a market? Are you better off with vertically integrated hierarchy? Or in modern times, are you better off with a platform? So what we actually tried to devise in this particular model is the first one, 
in a platform model, the owner then chooses how much, how open is your economy going to be? How much are you going to give away? How much can others build upon your ecosystem? You then get to choose your competition policy. That is, suppose that you build an app, how long do you get to charge for it? But I take it from you and let others build on that particular application. Okay? So that's, in effect, a competition policy that the platform gets to set. Another way to organize would be vertical integration. In this case, the platform not only makes all the decisions, it actually owns all the methods of production. So it's not developers producing the apps. The firm itself is producing all the apps. Now, this has certain advantages. One, you're not just building on the public code. You're also building on the private code. So that's an advantage. You're not having to pay royalties to anybody. So that's an advantage. And you're getting intellectual property rights in here that's actually. But you're not getting the spillover benefits. You're not getting this multiplier effect of other people building on each other. So you've lost the spillover, even though there are huge advantages of that. Lastly, suppose you run a different experiment. Give the decisions all the way back to the developers. Suppose the developers can choose to do it instead of the platform. That might mean each developer can choose to give their code away to other developers, which would allow them to build on that code. But what happens if you do that? Then you can't charge for it because you've given it away. So you've got a trade off as a developer. Can you make money on it? Or can you give it away and benefit the ecosystem? Which of these produces the most value over time? These are just intuitions. Okay? So here are the results. We've got platforms, hierarchies, and markets. Each of these is a different structural way of creating the most possible value. What we wind up showing is that for most of the economy, vertical integration hierarchy makes the most sense. But at some point, it tips. You move from hierarchical vertical integration to platform once network effects become big enough. That's the first thing that we show. It makes sense. Once you get the spillovers, once there are enough developers out there, you want to open up so that people you don't know bring you ideas you don't have. There's a flip once network effects become large enough. That is a key mechanism of production. But the next component of it is, OK, suppose we gave this all away to developers. Developers could choose for themselves to do that. What's fascinating is that even though the, the platform will eventually take away their property rights and give it to others for others to build on, you actually need that platform orchestration. Once the number of developers gets large enough, the developers themselves benefit from a larger ecosystem of having someone do the management, do the orchestration to say, OK, I'm not going to take all these apps so all of you can build on them. Now think about it. This is, you go back to Windows versus Linux. Where did developers choose to develop? They chose for Windows, not for Linux. Windows expanded. Even though Microsoft took so many of their apps and folded them back in, whether it was disk defragmentation, browsers, other things, uh, Microsoft took those away. Same thing today. Are they developing for Linux or are they developing for um, uh, Android? They're developing for Android, again, because it's an orchestrated, growing ecosystem. All right? And again, so this is a fundamental difference in structural business model. Our argument is, once this happens, once that you have large enough network effects, the shift of managerial attention moves from inside the firm, where you are orchestrating production, to outside the firm, where others are doing production for you. Fundamentally different shift in the business model. Our claim is all the stuff we teach in a business school, whether it's marketing, or logistics, or strategy, or IT, or R&D, all of these change. So I put the math part aside, and now we're going to go back into the managerial implications. So anyone who's asleep can now wake up again. OK, so I'll try to give you the intuitions, but now I'll give you the applications of it. All right? What this means is you now then shift internal attention to external attention. We'll start with marketing because it's one of the most obvious. And I like to use Coca-Cola as an example because why? Coca-Cola was the most famous company in the world pre-platform. They were the best ones at doing marketing and branding. Their slide said the evolution of marketing was from single message to segmentation to individual tailoring to now virality and social influence. What's fascinating is that now even the vocabulary, so this is the Coca-Cola slide, not mine. Even the vocabulary has now changed from push and outbound, where the firm made the messaging, to pull and inbound, where it's customer self-service and customers doing the messaging. To actually give you further illustration of this, 
Dropbox shares files, Instagram shares user photos, OpenTable shares reservations, PayPal bought rewards. We had a wonderful description of Handy actually subsidizing in order to get adoption in here, and the users to bring in other users. There's a wonderful observation from Harvard Business Review. The path to profitable growth may lie in a company's ability to get its customers to, in effect, become its marketing department. It's a brilliant shift of externalization of value. That's marketing. So how many of you have an MBA or studied in a business school? Ah, oh, see, now I got hands off, OK? <laughs> Look at this. How many of you have heard of Porter's value chain? I see you're still awake. OK. Porter's value chain is effectively this, inbound logistics, operations, outbound marketing, and sales. It's really easy to represent that schematically as a simple pipeline, OK? So what you think of is taking the components of a good adding steps in a value-adding process and bringing the, the source inputs to the outputs of your customers. Take Coca-Cola. You take sugar and water, flavoring, and tons of branding, and you get your sugar water to your customers at the other end of the pipe. Coca-Cola takes control of all of the distribution. That's not how platforms operate. Platforms separate the production consumption, the two-sidedness, and they lift it off platform. It's outside. From there, you're doing things. So Uber isn't owning the cars. Airbnb isn't providing rooms. From there, what you're doing is you're letting third parties produce, and you're selecting the high-quality content and matching that to an end consumer. So third parties are doing it. Again, just to illustrate that, you're taking the high-quality stuff and keep kicking the low-quality stuff off, and then putting the high-quality stuff on. And there's a whole range of these business models. On the far left, Dell, Coca-Cola, ExxonMobil is a literal pipeline business. And on the far right is a pure platform business in between are hybrids. Apple, Samsung, Intel, they make stuff. They're in between. So you have a platform on top of a product. Also, we notice there are B2C examples and there are B2B examples. You know, ExxonMobil, Intel, Salesforce, all those are B2B examples. And as you move from left to right, guess what? You get more network effects. You get an increase in users attracting users, drivers attracting writers, hosts attracting guests, apps attracting developers. All of that happens. You get the benefits of network effects. You get phenomena like 40,000 rooms in Paris or 8,000 in Berlin. There is no way Marriott or Hilton or Intercontinental could afford the capital costs of that many rooms in a city. It makes no sense whatsoever. You know, and again, you know, to recapitulate a phrase most of you will have heard, Airbnb doesn't own the rooms, Uber doesn't own the cars, Alibaba doesn't have the inventory, Facebook doesn't own the content. The users do that. Why do platforms scale so fast? Dirt simple. Zero marginal cost production. You can scale as fast as you can add partners. Your bottleneck is the curation of quality. It's not the addition of capacity. It's as fast as you can add partners. Very different business model. What about finance? Well, this one, you know, there was a wonderful debate here about what Uber's is worth. But really, the real, t real issue is not valuing the assets of the firm. We showed earlier, it's no longer the capital assets. It's often more the intangible assets. If you look at the major acquisitions that have been taking place, LinkedIn, Skype, Waze, Instagram, WhatsApp, you know, Red Hat, Twitch, what they're buying, you know, they appear to overpay initially. What they're buying is the external community in each of these cases. They're providing professional networks, the photographers, the developers, the videographers, the data scientists. If you look at Instagram, yes, it appeared weird to pay a billion dollars for a company with 13 employees and no physical assets. But guess what? They had 30 million users. You can do the math. That's 33 bucks per user. Today, it's 40 to 50 bucks per user. That was a bargain by comparison. It's a really, really interesting way to look at that. It's the users that are creating value. To give a fun illustration of this, you know, here in Instagram's case, you know, he goes to the moon and takes five photos. They go to the bathroom and take 37. <laughs> right? The users are creating all this information. You need to be at the interception point to capture it and make sure that you get some of that value. Human resources, this one's also blindingly obvious. In this case, what we used to teach is hierarchy. That was the model I showed you a moment ago. Then information technology allowed you to flatten organizations so that you could manage more staff with um, you know, the same resources. But now what are we doing? We're actually moving to what you might call cloud labor, freelance labor, markets outside the firm where you can contract and then pull the value back inside the firm. You know, as simple illustrations, 
you know, do you want to go contract with a travel agent inside your company, or does it make more sense to go get tens of thousands of reviews on TripAdvisor? Do you want an you know, internal lawyer for 350 an hour, or do you want to get free answers on Rocket Lawyer? Or do you want to go contract on Upwork, or Zubadje, or Freelancer? You can contract for a lot of that stuff and get cloud labor outside the firm as needed. Again, externalization. One of the less obvious ones, but really important, is information technology. In this case, you can watch the evolution of the firm. It's been very straightforward over the past several decades, if you pay attention to the IT function. It started with enterprise resource planning, or back office systems. We then moved to, and there was inventory, restocking uh, workflow, to customer resource management. These are front office systems, lead tracking, taking orders, point of sale, customer support, campaign management. But now, it's even out of office systems. There, it's search engine optimization. It's analysis, inbound traffic, media monitoring, sentiment analysis outside the firm. We're using IT to manage external resources. One of the best descriptions of this was actually by a wonderful blog post by a guy that worked both at Amazon and at Google, who was the, he gave the Yegi rant, and he described Jeff Bezos' process of management at Amazon. And he points out, all teams are going to expose their data. They have to communicate through interfaces. No other form of interprocess communication is allowed, without exception. Well, number four is really important. I added the emphasis, but it's their phrase. Everything must be externalizable. Why? So others can build on it. You've built these incredible resources. This is how they got Amazon Web Services. Then they open it up to outsiders, which allows them to sell that spare capacity and attach to it. It's a huge benefit. To prove it to you, this is the number of APIs, application programming interfaces across different retailers. Okay, Walmart, Amazon, Sears, Target, Macy's. This is the market capitalization of these different firms. Okay, um, and over the last decade, Best Buy is almost out of business. Macy's is down. Walmart's done pretty well, 48% growth. Amazon, by contrast, has done 2,000 or more percent growth. Unbelievable. But think about it. You can only, Walmart and Amazon are both world class at logistics. But you can get logistics better and better and better and better. But up to a point, you cannot squeeze more value out of your logistics chain, so it must asymptote. So improving logistics has marginally less and less and less improvement per investment. By contrast, if you're opening your ecosystem and allowing third parties to build on top, What's the limit? It's the number of stores, it's the number of transactions that take place, it's much greater potential for growth. Again, externalization of the inverted firm. Another great example, research and innovation. R&D, how is this traditionally done? Well, it used to be done by the firm itself. But what I really like to emphasize by someone from Silicon Valley, investor who's really done a beautiful job of this, if you consider Mark Andreessen as an example, he points out a platform is a system that can be adapted to needs and niches not anticipated by the designers. What's this mean? People you don't know can bring you ideas you don't have. This allows for innovation that you wouldn't even have conceived of, let alone built in the first place. It's fun to illustrate this using a tangible product from the industrial era just to show you how and why this matters. So we can use, you know, what was the first modular recomposable product? It's something like the, the Model Ford T. Users could take it apart and put it back together again from which they built hay carriers, flour mills, race cars. Ford should have done that one. Mobile churches, snowmobiles, sawmills, and goat carriers. Each of these were innovations that users created as opposed to the community. What's really important, and again, this is essential for traditional strategy, is think about the resources you have to own and the resources you don't. Imagine a platform as the infrastructure on which you build. Remember that math model I showed you a little while ago? Think of the infrastructure that you're gonna build and then you're going to open it up. Now, if this is, Word, this is Microsoft Windows, yeah, you probably do want to own Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. That's the value at the head of the distribution. There is absolutely no reason why you need to own every single app that's out there. In fact, you shouldn't. 
What you need to do is to open the ecosystem to let third parties build on top. That's exactly what we modeled a moment ago. It's that seed corn that gives others the ability to open and then build things out there. Then what happens? As another simple illustration, consider the sum of value from here, that's what you're creating, versus the sum of value all the way out over around the rest of the room. The last tiny sliver is nothing. You don't really care about it. But the integral, the sum of all that value, completely dwarfs the value the firm itself is creating. That is why ecosystems beat products. Okay. Again, to illustrate this in a, in a mathematical sense, it's a very simple idea. This is your own innovation trajectory. I really don't care what the slope of this is. How good is your innovation department at coming up with new innovations? Now, suppose that you manage to get third parties to come help you out. If that's the case, they add to your slope, then you get a higher rate of innovation. The beauty here is you can start from a lower value proposition and you have to overtake whoever the leader is. It's a mathematical certainty because you're innovating at a higher rate. You simply need enough time. That's the basic change of slope. If you manage to design feedback into your system, then you get something like that and you really win. Again, platforms innovate faster than product firms because they're getting ideas they don't have from people they don't know and they're innovating in new ways at faster paces. The other element of the business model design, what's your cost if Flappy Birds fails in the marketplace? You don't bear that cost. It's almost zero. What's your upside if Angry Birds does succeed in the marketplace? It's 30%. You've got the option on the upside, and you've shed the cost of failure. That is a hell of a business model innovation. So you're innovating at a faster pace, and your cost structure is fundamentally different in this business model. Strategy also changes. It is fun to illustrate with what happened 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when Apple entered the market. At the time Apple entered, seven firms looked like they were unassailable. They had 99% of all industry profits. They had famous brand names, Nokia, Samsung, Sony Ericsson, Motorola, BlackBerry, RIM, HTC. They had supply side economies of scale. They were telecom firms, so they had regulatory protection. They had world class logistics. Nokia had dropped 40 billion in R&D alone, so they should have had the most recent features. But what's interesting is that six late years later, one firm had 91% of all industry profits. Everyone else but one was losing money. It's extraordinary how one firm came from it. I love the, the question asked by the CTO of Nokia. Geez, was the management at all seven firms clueless? These are seven different companies that look like they've been doing really well. These were not dumb people. What happened? We'd argue the nature of the business model has changed. The platform business model differs from the product business model. It's an inverted firm. You're capturing third party valuation. Something else fundamentally is different. Again, what do we teach in business school? Well, the basics often in strategy class are a protected market niche. You create barriers to entry to keep your profits high. You want either product differentiation to justify your high prices, or you need a really low cost structure in order to sustain low prices. And you want to control the inimitable resources. We just saw that you don't have to own everything. You need the stuff at the head of the distribution. You want to open everything else, so that one doesn't apply. Another interesting element of it is really what you're not looking at is barriers to entry. Here, you're looking at engagement. We heard from Handy. What did they want? They wanted many bookings. They want as many bookings as possible. You want engagement on your platform. You want retention and more bookings from that. So you, the network effects give you your demand economies of scale, which create a different kind of barrier to entry than your supply side economies of scale. The multi-homing reduces that, so you have to be careful about that. The other thing you want to do is frictionless entry of production and consumption. You want as many riders and drivers as possible, as many handy men as possible on handy. You want as many producers on uh, content on Facebook. So in some sense, you want frictionless entry of production and consumption in your inverted firm. And also, it's possible competitors can add value. Skype is a Microsoft product, but it's on Apple and Google. Google Maps is on Apple. Amazon uh, Kindle is a 
Amazon platform product, but it's on Android and Apple. The issue is, are you adding a unique source of value, and are you controlling the relationship and the data? Under those circumstances, even a competitor can bring a unique source of value that adds value to your platform. As long as you retain control of the data and the relationship, that's OK. And it can actually add value and reduce your antitrust concerns if you're letting the um, other players in there. To illustrate more broadly, think of what happened with Android and with iPhone. These two products wiped out sales of a dozen different products, a dozen different products. Garmin GPS, TomTom Tom GPS, Canon cameras, Nikon cameras, Olympus voice recorders, Sony PlayStation portables, e-readers, Nokia cell phones, BlackBerry cell phone, Microsoft Zoom, Cisco Flip video camera, the Jawbone fitness tracker, Fitbit fitness tracker, HP programmable calculators, Timex watches, Filofax day planners. How the hell do you fend the boundaries of a market you can't define? Filofax day planners don't look like Timex watches, which don't look like GPS systems. Those market boundaries don't look anything like one another. The other thing is, you don't have to control the assets. Your partners can bring you those things. Apple killed off HP calculator sales without even trying, because other people created free versions of HP calculators rather than HP doing it. You don't have to control those assets. You must invite them into your ecosystem and have them build on top. So most of those traditional rules of strategy just don't work in platform markets anymore. It's a different way of organizing your interactions. To summarize for the strategy, under products, it used to be the case you had distinct buyers and suppliers. Well, now your riders can become your drivers. Your suppliers can become your buyers. You used to focus on core competencies, and now it's core interactions. Again, it's bookings. It's supply side economies of scale versus demand economies of scale. It's your assets versus community assets. It's barriers to entry and boulevards to exit versus permissionless entry of production and consumption on these things. It's a fundamentally different business model. We'll never argue that supply side economies of scale don't matter anymore. Of course they will matter. But it's also the case that demand side economies of scale matter. You have to manage them differently. Again, articulating it for each of the different functions that we teach in a business school, whether it's finance, human resources, R&D, strategy, ops, every single one of these is an illustration of what I pointed out earlier. You must manage the value creating activities outside the firm, where once we used to manage them inside the firm. It is an inverted firm. It is a different way of organizing business. So let me go back to the model and see if we can answer some questions. So if you were paying attention, didn't fall asleep in the math portion of it, this is a recapitulation of the two propositions, all right? One was when do platforms beat hierarchies of vertical integration? And the other was, when does it make sense to actually let platforms organize in favor of developers? All right, so these were the two points. Now, let's go back to antitrust as an interesting question. What does it mean for breakup? Suppose that we divide firms up and we break them up. What would this do? It would reduce the network effects and move us away from the platform business model. I can illustrate this for you with an intuition all of you will recognize. What's the proportion of value as the users go up? Anyone want to motion that with your hand? It's, yep, uh, the folks from yeah, was over here. Exactly, right? It's that, right? It's Metcalf's law, right? It's based on the number of connectivities rising proportional to n squared. Now, dirt simple. Let us suppose that we divide Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp into three separate firms. Now what happens? Really simple. Well, now we have three firms, we square that value, and we have to get some of them back, and we have three of them, and that gives us one third. So look at the value creation over time. Breakup's a stupid idea. Yes, you create competition in prices, but no, you do not produce more value. It's a dumb idea. There is, however, another alternative. If you're following the open banking legislation in Europe, we now actually look at PSD2. This is the regulation that gives you the right to open your ecosystem to third parties. So all banks must now implement APIs in such a way that you as a user can grant access to manage your banking to other firms that could actually do this. Now what happens? You've not divided the firm. You've brought in more potential users, more potential value that the firms themselves didn't think of. What does that do? In that context, 
what we get is adding a new group of users, which increases at a higher rate. We can now combine economics and an earlier concept from law, the essential facilities doctrine. Okay? In the essential facilities doctrine, go back to a railroad. Does it make any sense to have three separate companies lay railroad tracks from New York to Chicago? Of course not. That's idiotic. It's incredibly expensive and a huge waste of resources. So what do you do? You lay the railroad tracks, it's essential facilities, and then you invite competition on top of the railroad tracks. What this means is that three different companies can now compete to offer service on top of the same rail. Now you get an efficient income. Rather than regulating it, you've re-restored regulatory competition. That is a better solution to the problem. Okay? Let's take the second one. It makes sense to have the platform orchestrate as opposed to developers doing it themselves. Why? Because in an individual developer case, I'd love to work on your code if you'll give it to me. I'd like to keep mine private. Doesn't that make sense? Right? But it keeps, if everyone does that, then you don't get the virtue of compound growth over time. You don't get the network externality. Now what happens? Let's apply that to GDPR. What does GDPR do? It gives back the rights to the individual to control their data. What does this do? Of course that creates privacy, but it creates islands of negotiation and islands of secrecy, which reduces value. It's a bad idea if your goal is to create value. If your goal is to create privacy, it will have that effect. But if your goal is to create social value, it cannot achieve that effect. This was entirely predictable. Our model was developed before GDPR passed. But now, if you don't believe me that that's the result, take a look at the facts. These are what happened. The use of cookies fell. 70% of marketers believe that targeting ads is far more difficult. VC firms investing fewer euros in European startups. And oh, by the way, you actually make the incumbents stronger. Yes, you've made it a little bit harder for them, but you've made it a lot harder for all the startups. So although it's maybe a little bit harder for them, relative to the incumbents, it's actually worse off for the startups and the small guys. It's unbelievable, but entirely predictable. Now we've got a model for thinking about how to work through these very issues. Okay? We've got a better model because you understand the nature of value creation in a platform economy as distinct from a product economy. So let's go back to our questions. Why do platform firms high, have high market caps with so few employees? Take the inverted firm. Well, inverted firms harness users or producers, so they're not on the books. They're not employees. So it appears as though they have, they have functional assets that don't appear on the books. Of course that's the case. That then affects the multipliers. How do they scale so fast? They have zero marginal costs of production. You can add production as fast as you can add partners. Your only bottleneck is scale. That's how they move so fast. Why do platform firms always beat product firms? Platform of value appreciates through use as opposed to depreciate for use. That's a network effect. Users creating value for users. Also, they innovate faster. So they actually have a higher innovation trajectory. Why is the shift in executive mindset so hard? What you're doing is you're shifting from assets you control, from traditional strategy, to orchestration of resources of unknown partners who must volunteer them. You have to think from their perspective, why should they bother to help you? If you're going to take the assets, they're not going to invest in you. You have to think of what your invitation strategy is going to be to bring others in. It's a different way of thinking about organizing your business. And how are we going to regulate platforms? You understand the mechanism of value creation in an ecosystem via network effects, and you can design vastly better regulation. In this context, breakup is a bad idea. Why? Of course you get competition. Competition is not, however, the end goal. The end goal is value creation. So in this case, breakup, separating WhatsApp from Facebook, from Instagram, is a bad idea. You know, and interesting enough, the German regulation was, OK, it's OK for Facebook to add to buy Instagram, reducing the competition, but then you can't integrate the data. So you don't get the value. That was about the worst legislation you could have had. Terrible idea. In this case, um, 
GDPR has that same effect. It restores privacy, but it creates islands of negotiation and islands of secrecy, preventing value creation for society. A vastly better way to do that is something like PSD2, also European legislation. But instead of creating these islands, it grants third party access, which allows others to create value. You want to combine the essential facilities doctrine with this access, which then creates network effects. Every single one of these is an instance of using the concept of an inverted firm. So where are we going to, this is going to happen in lots and lots of different markets. So we can see it in automotive, with operating system for the car. We're going to see it in uh, finance, not just with blockchain, but essentially in open banking. Interestingly, we're seeing it abroad faster than we're seeing it in the United States. Singapore is moving ahead at light speed with city as platform. Governments can start to be organized this way and, and create more economic growth. Internet of Things will be a uh, platform. Energy markets and smart grids are becoming marketplaces for energy, also organized as platforms. Construction industry, the building information modules and architecture is going to be organized as platforms. Yeah, we academics too are on the chopping block. Education also will be organized as a platform. And of course, recognize healthcare as moving into a platform. Amazon is already starting to move in and organize as a platform. And yes, it will be more efficient than traditional business models, and it should be. We want that, and we're going to need it in the healthcare industry. So I leave you just with a few summary thoughts. One, now these, to answer the original question, are platform firms different? You bet they are. They are fundamentally different. They are driven by demand economies of scale, also called network effects, rather than supply side economies of scale. The implication is you invert the firm because of network effects. This affects all of the things we teach in business school, whether it's strategy or innovation, uh, marketing, human resources, what have you. You must shift managerial attention from inside to outside. Information and community are critical resources. You actually have to invite third parties to come in and reward them for helping you out. This is why governance matters so much. And lastly, we're going to design policy based on how value is created as opposed to look at value creation as distinct from creating competition or creating privacy. We'll use those simply as levers in the longer term to create value. And from that, we can actually design not just better firms, but we can design better policy as well. So for those of you who are interested, um, this is the resources on that. So we have the, the book on how to do this. Um, Harvard Business Review, I think, is outside. And I think the um, World Economic Forum report is there. If those of you are brave and you want the math version of it, that's that one, OK? The three of them are really easy reads. There's not an equation in any of them. Um, the third one is the one with the equations, if you are brave enough and actually want that. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, interesting question. So how would I square? this with lower productivity growth um, in, the, in the economy. Let's distinguish between two different things. Um, one is efficient asset use. And I actually think efficiency of asset use has been rising. So you, know, you might use an Uber car only two hours a day or your spare bedroom two weeks a year. The asset use is going up. What's happening also, however, is that we're getting smaller firms, if you will. And so in some ways, you're losing the supply side economies of scale, even as you're gaining some of the others. So I suspect that we're getting some further efficiencies in asset use and spare capacity. And that's also, by the way, which is keeping prices deflationary. Prices have not gone up because we're actually bringing, getting more efficient use of existing assets. But we're actually losing some of the economies of scale that you sometimes get with big firms. That would be my speculation. Yeah, we're, question over here. We're starting to hear examples of blatant manipulation on platforms. You know, Amazon manipulating um, information so you only, you know, the first uh, products you search for are Amazon branded products and they're not necessarily at the friendliest price. Uh, similarly, in the Wall Street Journal today, there's a story about content manipulation uh, on Instagram. So how do you see that playing out? And then as a second question, what's going to happen with all this so-called labor, the free labor? When, is, when are the data providers to platforms going to rise up and demand payment? So um, all right, two very interesting different questions. Remember this, it's too far back to actually get it. But remember the slide I showed you of the platform with uh, Word, PowerPoint, and Excel, and everything else is the apps? 
what you want to do is limit the competition on top of the platform for the goods also sold by the platform. The platforms will tend to reduce the market failures when they're not in competition, and they, but they tend to favor their own things when they are in competition. Uh, so good policy will actually re require two different elements. The first is to limit the ability of the platform to bias in favor of itself. How would it do that? Well, this is, this is where regulation is needed. As an illustration, the Indian government tried to say, you can't compete in a market in where um, you can't have more than 25 for own ownership of the products sold in your own marketplace. Otherwise, you can't run the marketplace, as an example, at which point Amazon suddenly sold its stake, you know, stake and to bring it to 24%. But um, that's an element of it. There's another piece of it which will often be missed in it, however, which is this question over here. So you don't want to, you do want to increase the competition, or re reduce the bias in the marketplace, but you do want to allow the economy to still capture supply side economies of scale when possible. So it's going to be a difficult balancing act to allow Amazon to do something like work on cloud systems, at which it's really good, and if that's essential, we are going to get supply side economies of scale relative to policing its misbehavior in favoring its own products in the marketplace. So we've got to balance those two considerations in order to get it correct. Now, remind me of your second question again. About the so-called labor on platforms, that is, people providing data and content for free. When do you see the platform becoming So I think that will. So let, let me again draw an analogy between what I think we're actually early days in the platform economy. Again, if you go back to my claim about the monopolization in the industrial era, how long did it take until we got labor laws in the industrial economy? In this case, what we are seeing is another form of market failure. The gigantic firms have disproportionate market power. And so what we need is another form of collective bargaining of users or suppliers or others to allow them to restore and regain some of those rights. I am certain we will start to see some of those things and regulation enabling those kinds of things in order to claw back some of the power from the center. I will also argue, and you can, I'll go on record as saying it now as part of our own research agenda, we, you and I are in effect serfs in the fiefdom of Zuckerberg and Bezos and Page and others, okay? At this point in time, we need to design the Magna Carta of rights for citizens in those domains in which we operate. At the moment, we don't have the power to do that, and I think we do need to do that, and that is part of the research agenda going forward, how to do that, okay? Other questions? Yes. So as the network increases, uh, there is a danger that the low denominator uh, will uh, control the outcome. So inequality and a huge volume of users or information or suppliers, it's very difficult to see the rise of the highest uh, value. It will be a kind of a average uh, out to the lowest denominator. Do you see this as a trend or a danger here? I'll be honest, I'm not sure I agree with that. I'll give you two or three examples. It was the case that when Airbnb started, they didn't insure homeowners against parties being thrown in the, in the home. That was a mistake, and they got some really bad publicity out of it, and now they do insure good behavior of people who are resident in another home. Or if someone gives you a bad experience on an Uber drive, then they were policed and they're booted off the platform. The platform, as governor of its ecosystem, is motivated to get healthy transactions on the platform in order to prevent transactions failure. eBay will try to help you out if you have a bad deal on that. We heard Handy tries to keep good deals uh, on its platform. I'm not convinced that it's a race to the bottom. A good platform that implements good governance tries to ensure healthy interactions on the platform. I honestly think the bigger problem is the one of bias where it competes for the services rather than where you have a race to the bottom because in that case, one side of the market gets mistreated, they flee, and the network effects work in reverse. I'm less worried about that one. So uh, most of the examples that you give comparing product and platform companies, I would say the platform companies started as platform companies like Facebook, like Amazon. Uh, 
So in the traditional legacy world, uh, what are some of the good examples you've seen where a company, which is traditionally a, plat a product company, is appending itself to become a platform company? So three of my favorites are Siemens, John Deere, and uh, Klokner Steel. These are interesting B2B examples that were existing. So in Siemens' case, they're a maker of industrial products, and now they're creating MindSphere, which is an industrial platform for IoT, to enable third parties to attach, to actually deliver services inside the organization, and they're actually moving along very successfully. Uh, they're actually observing some of the mistakes that were made by GE Predix, who are trying to do something similar, another illustration uh, in that case. Uh, Klopner Steel is a fascinating case of creating a marketplace on top of steel products, where one of their biggest internal challenges was getting internal executives to accept competitors' products in their market. They realized this was a good idea, and eventually they did do it and, and move forward. Uh, perhaps one of the most interesting examples is actually John Deere tractors. You wouldn't think of a tractor as a platform, but you can do a number of different things for it. So not only is it like an Uber where it's a heavy asset and you're using it twice a year, so you're not, you might really like to create an Uber for tractors, but once you've got that, you can then sell through fertilizer and geolocation services and commodities training and insurance and training and job shopping. All of these things are additional services that can be sold on top. So those are examples of existing companies that have made the transition. But I think there are, there are ways to do that. Matter of fact, there's some wonderful research. Um, you know, the, the launch chapter in the book has a little bit on the launch strategies. And it differs if you're starting with nothing versus starting with something in place. So I think, I think we're out of time. I'll see you over lunch. Thank you.